Hello, everybody. My name is Lenore von Stein, and this is another episode of The Facts. And this is another discussion episode, and the second in a series of discussions on education. And with, uh, with the same two people that are sitting with me tonight, we had another discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Bill Crane and Professor Alan Feigenberg. Both of these people are uh, work at City College. Uh, Bill is a, in psychology, and Alan is in architecture. And um, tonight we're we are, we we're going to talk about uh, arts training and and arts. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sacrifice, art stagnation, and uh, and uh, and and uh, the political implications of that, and uh, and also we're going to talk about how the physical environment. Um, I remember one time I I write for I I'm always you know putting together jobs, trying to make a living, get through the day, and uh, I, I I often work for nonprofits, uh, raising money and writing grants for them, and one of them I had worked for for a while, and they took me to this. They, de they dealt with uh, severely mentally ill children, poor mentally ill children. They took me to one of their clinics. And the clinic, I was so angry when I saw this place with the, with the horrible, um, I grew up in a housing project, reminded oh, yeah. me very much of some of those things. With the, the, what, what is, like the brick that just, not brick, but big, big things of concrete that had mm -hmm. just painted over and many leaks had happened mm -hmm. and there was then the chairs were broken and and I turned to the people I was working for that and I I, I, I think this is one of the few things that got me fired there was a list of them <laughs> and uh, I said how can you how can you how can you expose these families to this? how can you expose these children to this what do you what do you don't this is terrible yeah. this is and and they didn't want to hear that at all but but it, 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 how does physical environment affect? Oh, I think uh, it affects all of us. I'll talk a little about the architecture, the, the design and built environment. A number of years ago, um, I was part of a, um, a group that we work in the public schools with teachers and kids around their environments. And it was one day, this was a, a public school, elementary school across from the Bronx Zoo. We'd been working there. One day we got there, and the kids were all out on a um, fire drill. This was first through fifth graders. And most of the kids were lined up, and the group we were working with were all intensely involved in this discussion and argument. And we listened in what was about, they were looking at the buildings around them, and they were having a discussion. They didn't, were, didn't live in any building. They said, well, that one's for poor people, and that <laughs> one's for rich people. And we were listening, and we said, well, how do you know that? And they look at us like second, third graders, like we're stupid. They <laughs> said, well, it's easy. See that building there? has small, small windows, and there are bars on the windows, and the brick is all the same color. And look at that building there. It has balconies and big windows. So I think the whole message of our environment, what we call symbiotics, nonverbal communication, is very apparent. For many centuries, the, um, the architecture that emboldened society were religious ones, the churches, the spires. And they always rose above everything else. Everything else was lower. And this was the ascent up to heaven. Well, we have that now. If you look in New York City, where are cathedrals? They're the 100, 120-story office buildings that play this role of the religion of capitalism and mm -hmm. profits. So much bigger than us. Yeah, so much bigger than us. Actually, we, we're at a place, unfortunately, Bill has to teach there in what's called the Knack Building. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible, the message it gives. It's all the concrete block. Most classrooms have no windows. Right. And when I bring kids up there, again, elementary school kids up there, they'll look and they'll say, it looks like a jail. And it's not that they've been in jails, but they have this image of this enclosed space with bare materials, very unattractive, very confining, and to them that's a jail. So think about our schools and kids are going to buildings they think look like jails. What are we telling our children about who they are when this happens? Yeah, I, I have a story about um, an experiment in Berkeley, California in the early 70s, um, a landscape uh, architect Named, or a planner named Robin Moore decided to take up the asphalt and put in a nature area with a pond and, and pretty wild bushes and, bushes and trees. And the kids said it was you know, kind of overgrown uh, and the kids liked exploring it. And, um, and when, um, in the, uh, instead of the concrete, the children found it very soothing and interesting and apparently beautiful. And when a, a kid came from another country, he came to the... Um, 
came in there and he saw the kids over there playing, the first uh -huh. thought was that they were playing in some rich people's garden. <laughs> he said, oh, I'm going to tell on you kids, he <laughs> said, because uh, they're, trespassing. He, yeah, they're trespassing. And so mm. the, um, the barren concrete is, is mostly the monotonous barren concrete is what, what um, the inner city kids are exposed to. And I think you, you move more and more into the wealthier areas, they start seeing more trees and greenery. And um, it's still, though, highly manicured. It's not the yeah. real exciting natural environment that is. That yeah, it's is. very French. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not the wild, which is, I think, in the most inspirational the, when the, the, the when the kids um, discover things. And um, in terms of the arts, I once um, I once. Uh, g I looked at anthologies, every anthology I could find of children's poetry, that is the poetry that children themselves composed between the ages of two and eight years. And about two thirds to three quarters of it was inspired by nature. The, the, they were writing about leaves or the sun or the birds or um, why a bird, everybody walks by a bird and nobody notices a bird. And they wrote the poems, but they were, uh, they were in, inspired about a, a f right about a flower that's in the morning is kind of bent over and mm -hmm. the, the four-year-old girl asks, why are you bent over like this little flower? And you know, was, was the dew heavy on you? And be beautiful things, uh, poems, but they, they were, the, nature was consistently the inspiration of, uh, so that, that part of the physical environment, I think, um, the natural environment, I think, is an inspiration, the beauty of it. So much of it, so much of what we put the playgrounds in New York City and are really ugly. Um, they're they're built structures and there's concrete, sand, and water, and nothing natural. If you go into Central Park, there's nature on the way to the to the little playgrounds, but it, everybody runs right past it. The rocks are interesting, <laughs> and the growth, and especially those wild areas down the north part of Central Park, is pretty interesting. But nobody's in there. They're scared to even go in there. There's like a fear of it. And they I mean, nature makes sense, right? And it would have to be a really good uh, landscape architect to make something yeah. really as wonderful. I, I remember going to this arts colony and at this arts co somewhere upstate, and I, I just uh, and I couldn't believe how bad the landscaping was. They had yeah. all these phony rocks and all this phony, and it was so poorly done. It, it hurt. Yeah. Uh, and and this was an arts colony. Uh, 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 so, I, I, I lost my I lost my train of thought. Uh, so the, the so the, the 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 messages that that people get from these these hospitable or inhospitable mm -hmm. uh, physical environments from these physical environments that make sense. I mean, a tree always makes sense. You know, it makes sense. You know, but somebody m building a building does that. You know, make does it. I have a friend who's an architect, and we'd walk down the street, and, and I, I'd say, you know, I saw a building that I liked. He said, why do you like that building? Why don't you like right. this building? Much more conventional building that he thought was a good building, you mm -hmm. know. But no, I don't, it doesn't appeal to me. I mean, this is, when I was a kid and I, I grew up in New York, if I would see a building that was different, I liked it. Just be different, for right, goodness sake. Please. <laughs> you know, and, and, but not, you know, but not you, horrible. You, be, you were s saying before we started the show that there's a lot of, Imitation and th to be different is is threatening in some ways to the well yeah, one in of the, the things, art world. One, one one of the things that you know when in, in the teaching of arts, for instance, in the teach, let's just say in the in the using of arts in school, how do you how how can you how can you uh, if if the kids are not allowed to to deal with things that actually interest them, and that includes you know bad mouthing you or whatever you know mm -hmm. that includes taking on authority, mm -hmm. then how are they ever? going to get to, 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 uh, I remember when I was in the fourth grade, I drew a picture of some nuns, and I was so frightened for so long to draw this picture that had been in my mind, and it was such a wonderful release when I drew this picture uh -huh. and the sky didn't fall in, you know, <laughs> uh, and um, so, you know, how can, how can, I mean, I, when I substitute in public schools and they're teaching uh, Broadway musicals, and it, 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 it makes my hair stand back on my, I, I can't believe it. I, I, it's, 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 it's this combination of, well, I, it, it, the teacher's not being very creative and, and, and not being able to, not being frightened of stepping over 
real and imagined lines uh, into into uh, into into what what's what are the kids thinking about? Because you 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 really have to. Um, there's a there's a this is a silly little, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the guy who plays my band, Andrew Bolotowski, is the son of a major painter, Ilya Bolotowski, mm -hmm. and his daughter is in a school. And his daughter was drawing, and the and the and the teacher said she's she doesn't she's not doing well. And this kid draws all the time. This kid takes pictures. This kid has got parents who are musicians. A grandfather is a you know abstract expressionist. I mean, I, I, smart anyway. You know, and and there was no way that that Andrew could talk to this teacher about so about art. I guess what I'm saying is it, it, it's it's a nasty story. But I guess what I'm saying is that we are so removed from what this is art. From the create that we we can't talk about it and and or we so rarely talk about it and in schools do an awful lot and I've been to a couple of these school trainings uh, mm -hmm. to kind of e eviscerate mm -hmm. the, the the your uh, your private mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. you know which is really all you have to offer other people. Well, sure. Well, let's go further. I mean, one of the things. We see constantly the recent so-called budget crisis, and you look at schools, and what's the first thing that gets wiped out? The arts. The arts and phys ed, right? And language. Well, and then language, and then, but not the math and science, because those are critical. Right. Right. So what happens is, you know, the arts are seen by society and by educators as being secondary, peripheral, not important. And I think that affects. So the teaching of it very often is done in a very rigid way because there's better art and worse art. And I think the whole, Id the whole idea is consistent of not, not looking as students as trying to facilitate to develop them as critical thinkers. Yeah, I see the word you have down right. here, critical, critical thinkers. Critical thinkers, right? Um, I, an example to give you, our, our son-in-law is the principal of an alternative um, school, charter school in Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is all inner city kids. And the kids, it's a high school, and the kids uh, for their senior year, um, they take art courses at the museum, and they also put together a senior performance for graduation. And they develop, write, produce, direct, and stage their own thing. And we've been up there for a couple of them. It is just unbelievable. It is mind-boggling what these kids do because they're said, all right, this is your thing. We know you can do it. Go do it. We'll be there to support you but not to direct yeah. you. And the stuff they come with has been absolutely mind-boggling um, in terms of the setup, in terms of the acting, in terms of they write their own songs, and then mm. they perform it. How, you know, you, <laughs> there's a certain, what do you do about, there's a certain sometimes creativity in the rebellious kid, I think. What do you do? I mean, as a teacher, I think yeah. mostly I get mad when they're rebellious. But you're making me think that <laughs> you're making me think maybe I got to rethink that. Yeah. Um, I, re I I remember the um, while you guys were talking. I remember the f second day of school. We moved into a suburb Teaneck, New Jersey, and I was called in for a parent conference immediately. Um, and my son had written as a fifth grader he'd drawn a cartoon during math class and he had three of his friends and they he was some joke it's supposed to be humorous you know and it was just and and she sat down with the teacher and said what do you think of, look at that this was during class and, <laughs> and i said yeah you know and um like i didn't understand uh, she didn't know uh, an unusual parent i guess she didn't understand what i didn't see what was so bad about That's his cool. drawing it was it looked like a pretty interesting <laughs> cartoon uh, but there's. Well, she thought he, sh he was not paying attention. Wasn't. Yeah, yeah, he thought it was. It deserved a parent conference. I was called in. I thought there was something really bad that he'd hit another kid, or he'd stolen something, or he'd drawn a cartoon. Um, yeah, the the pressure to con conform. to toe the line and conform. How do you, you how do you do how do you deal with when the students? Or you well, I think it has to be much more. I mean, we have we have examples and models. I mean, many years ago. Um, Educator Debbie Myers started Central Park East, and there have been other programs like that around. And the basis of it is that kids learn because they want to learn what you're saying they're interested in, and instead of setting it up in these 
these these rigid um, segments mm -hmm. is to broaden it out. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, in one of the classes, there was this great teacher, Susan, and they were they had a process. And they were studying about I don't even remember what it was, and the the kids got very interested in the in the war, and she set up to do a field trip down to the Intrepid Museum where they have the warships, mm -hmm. right? And the kids, especially the boys, were really excited about this. This is elementary school. And she prepared them. They did readings and they did studies. And then she turned it into math by saying, well, how long is it going to take us? Oh, so one kid said, three minutes. And another kid said, four days. She said, well, how do we find out? So they got out maps and they learned to measure and they learned to scale and they learned to then pace off. And then they learned math by dividing, subtracting, and multiplying to find out how long it would take it. And they had to consider the fast kids and the slow kids. Then they went down, they visited, and the boys came back and they built a model of the Intrepid. And then it got interesting because they realized that at that scale they really didn't understand anything. They said, well, this is all made out of metal. How does it float in water? So Susan says, well, let's find out. Uh -huh. So they started doing experiments. And then other kids came in with questions, and the model kept growing and growing. And more and more of the kids became part of this. And some of the kids wanted to find out about airplanes. And some of the kids wanted to find out about World War II. And some of the kids wanted to find out about the Army. And simply setting up a visit to the Intrepid turned into an integrated uh, lesson in everything. Hmm. And it lasted for almost the entire year where the kids found in this topic an interest that turned them on. Mm -hmm. And they were teaching each other then. Mm -hmm. So the kids who figured out how metal can float because they tried it out, started teaching the other kids how metal floats. Since, since most of that's not going to be on the upcoming standardized <laughs> test, <laughs> exactly. so probably, there'd be a pressure in most schools to, to, right. to drop the whole... Yeah, move on, move on. Move on, uh, even though the kids are excited and learning. Yeah. And they're really thinking yeah. and developing their minds. Uh, they, they probably don't have time for this anymore. Yeah. When Beverly, when my wife had a, the Bronx New School set up, and they would integrate all the curriculum, and she would start getting phone calls from parents uh, what's the matter? Uh, I'm very disappointed and upset because my my son, my daughter, is saying they're not doing any math. Probably would say, well, c just come in. They come in. She said, just, just look. Well, the kids weren't doing math, but it wasn't sitting down doing three plus two and four divided by two. Some of the kids were interested in sports, so they were doing statistics uh -huh, uh -huh. on batting average and everything. Uh -huh. Some of the kids were interested in some of the else, so they were turning it into using math to solve problems rather than calling, stop, we're going to do math today. <laughs> so the kids, because they were having fun, they weren't defining it as math lessons. Right, right. At, um, city, <laughs> at city college, they get into debates on which math should come first, which, oh, right. which should come second, as if there is a, as, it doesn't a follow any. Yeah. Do you know that you, when your yeah. science is taught, you have biology, chemistry, and physics in high school? Yes. Do you know why that sequence? No. It's alphabetical. <laughs> That's darn. the rationale. There was differences among scientists of what basis. And if you think about it, I think about it, the logic is physics should be first because that's the most concrete. That's our everyday dealings. But it was alphabetical. Do you, Alan, do you, um, when you teach architecture, do, you, do they first learn a certain model of doing things that is a standard model before they're allowed to create or how do you? It depends on the teacher. I mean, I think fortunately the way architecture is set up is it goes to a studio. Uh -huh. And the encouragement is for students to experiment. Uh -huh. So they may all have the same assigned project, but the understanding is they can all come up with different answers and they can all be relevant. So you do all, you get to create, the flex the freedom to create different things. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very much encouraged. I think that's the good part of it. The downside, I would suggest, I think goes too far and encourages just individual differences uh -huh. rather than more group work and more group more collaboration. Group and then uh, in music, Lenore, do they, are you supposed to model a model first? Is, is, it, is the music instruction? Well, some of the, you were talking about, uh, uh, you were talking about bebop before. One of the, one of the ways, for instance, in the undergrad, my undergraduate degree is in, in jazz composition and mm. the, um, the, uh, the, the teacher would present a, uh, uh, I think this was a typical way, the teacher would present a, uh, you would be studying a, a particular musician, a particular uh, stage of, of the development of jazz, and then you would, uh, you, then you would, everybody in the class would have to write in that s style, and then everybody in the class was a musician, and so you'd, you'd put together an instant band, and you'd yeah. play each one of these compositions. 
and 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 you certainly and 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 later on in, in graduate school when I was in classical music it was it was it was not quite the same thing but the same emphasis on style and so I want to talk for a second about style because this is one of my big bugaboos because um, style to me seems like something you're looking at something from very far away rather than you know and you see the outlines of it uh, and 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 certainly for you know when you're studying some some skill that people or some whatever you want to call this in this case music you know understanding uh, for how this thing was put together and what are the elements that you see recurring that creates this event you know that you you can pick up by ear and uh, this is worth knowing if you're going to go into if you're a composer mm -hmm. um, but at the same time it has the it has a it has a, a, a secondary effect or maybe a primary effect of keeping people drawing within those lines uh -huh. Yeah. And that's the killer diller. That's the and that's the that's the that's the uh, that seems to be the effect on so many of the people because you know you don't want to be looked at as 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 not you know it's not it's not hip it's mm -hmm. not having good ears it's not having you know good taste. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to push out of these, you're going to do some some the which might be considered untasteful things. Mm -hmm. I mean. On this show, the facts. I want you all to know. I have been. I've been. While I watch my show, sometimes I think my demagoguery, my 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 all sorts of nasty stuff is is you know. But that's the is showing. But that's the road. That's the road out to something else. And if I if uh, uh, or at least that's what I hope. And um, so what happens in arts training and and and, and I, you know as as high up the totem pole as I've been. Uh, is that you? You you. You know you, you get caught in in both your teacher's limitations, uh -huh. and in and in in the lack of maybe just simply the lack of time. Aside from the lack of courage. guts, uh -huh. courage uh -huh. to uh, go beyond your comfort zone, uh -huh. uh, which is or, or go, you know, go look. It's. Go beyond. I, it, it, those aren't good words, but it's the best I have. Well, this. Well, how do you, how do you how do you deal with that in your field? I mostly talk about. <laughs> talk I mean, breaking those bounds or going. In child, yeah. In trying to get people to um, realize that children make their own discoveries and they have to make their own discoveries, I try to emphasize that. Mm -hmm and then trying to get them into some, I put a big emphasis on getting them into natural settings that are a little wild where they will make their own discoveries where they don't, you don't know what's gonna happen. We were talking, I was talking earlier about them, like you have the concrete at the right. one level, and then you get into the wealthier areas and you have g grass and trees, but it's manicured. So what, what, what resistance do you find to that? Then? Well, actually a, a vacant lot, which has a lot of weeds, yeah. Is is interesting educationally. It's very stimulating because kids can discover stuff. And they don't know what kinds of insects and flowers are going to come in a, mm -hmm. into it. So it's full of original discovery. A vacant lot, uh, a, vacant a weedy lots lot, a, a weedy mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. But most people will. They think they see a weedy lot and they think it have it's unkempt, dangerous. and it's dangerous. It's unkempt, it and dangerous. you don't. And, but you got to put up with a little bit so they get a something that gives them a little bit of a rash or so an insect bites them. But that's the, the, the children. That's a thrill part of the thrill of living yeah. um, and that's uh, I try to emphasize that as an uphill battle they say you, all these safety concerns come in yeah. and some of some of us are trying to say you gotta you, the idea you gotta add some risk life and even in child education to involve some risk that's getting it's a hard one but actually if a, a child learning to climb a tree say probably in, in, engages in less risk because they concentrate so much harder. You don't know how you're, where you're going to put your feet. You, it's an exploration as opposed to climbing a build structure that's got all of the uh, rungs and the ladder there. That's, similar pattern. It's a similar pattern and they don't concentrate so much, so they're more mm. likely to fall. They're, mo they're less likely to fall off a tree because they're, they're, all their senses are involved in, in the tree and it's, it, it, each new step is a challenge. Um, you, Let's Alan. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna move. We're I'm getting a two minutes. Okay, mark. I want to notice that Alan. I mean, he hasn't got the. You're known as a teacher who, you're modest about it, but you're known as a, te the, a the, pr the premier teacher in terms of 
enabling creativity. I mean, that's a, the reputation you have around the college. And students, former st the students I've had, I mean, oh, Dr. Fagenberg, that's, <laughs> it's very hard in some ways for them to, but he, he, he somehow gets me to go after my own ideas. And, wow. and uh, how do you do, do you I consciously? I just tried different ways. I, there's no, is this no your, pattern to it. Is this your goal? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. My, my goal is sometimes what I'll do is I'll have a class and I'll get up and I'll walk out of the room and go to the bathroom and I won't come back. <laughs> and when that class exists and continues without me, I know I'm successful. I've done that too. That, that, I mean, I, I've done it because I had to, but it, uh, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, if they're still talking, you put them in groups or whatever the project is and you come back right. and there's, and they're, we've got one minute and they're, uh, then, wow. Bingo. Bingo, you, you, you uh, uh, a student of mine said to me the other day, oh yeah, I like that part where we were all arguing. That's, that's the stuff, he said, that's, that's right. the stuff. It is. All right, all right, even though I. That's yeah. amazing how the <laughs> people come back to that. What they think, they look back on and think it was really exciting. You thought maybe it was chaotic, but we had a lot of trouble letting, letting learning become spontaneous and involving some chaos. We have a lot of trouble with that, and that's we have a lot of trouble with innovation. I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we we we've had a, a too short conversation. Yes. 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 And so maybe we'll we'll find some other times to be wonderful. Chat away. Good. That's fun. And uh, so so in 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 conclusion, <laughs> uh, I want to say goodbye conclusion. goodbye to everybody. Thank you for watching the facts. See ya. <laughs>